Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 116. This episode is Rob Coleman, who's just one of the nicest people ever. Easily one of my favorite people I've ever got to talk to. He is an animation director, animation supervisor, Canadian. Awesome. He's so cool, guys. Uh, We talked about how uh, he's actually from Canada. I did not know that beforehand. We talked about how uh, he worked for the National Film Board of Canada before moving to California to work at ILM in 93. Very cool. We talk about meeting Ray Harryhausen, working as an animation director, what exactly that job is. He's got a great story about working on Men in Black and then going into the prequels where he was the animation director. So cool. We even talked about uh, what that was like going into and taking on the pressure of bringing Star Wars back and how he almost talked himself out of the job. It's amazing. We talk about uh, episodes one, two, and three. We talk about how uh, working on the Yoda fight in episode two, all the different places that he grabbed inspiration from to make that thing happen. He worked on the Lego movie. We talk about Peter Rabbit, how the animation has grown so much from when he started to now. And just, he's the greatest. He's the greatest. You guys are going to love him. Let's just get right into it. Please enjoy the interesting podcast, episode number 116 with Rob Coleman. Theme song time. You're in Australia, though. You're on the other side of the planet. I am. I'm in Sydney. Yeah, I'm in Sydney. Nice, nice. I've been for... I'm in my 11th year now. I thought I was only coming for two years. Oh, really? Now it's 11 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Kind of the same. I originally came to... uh, Well, yeah. I I originally (laughs) came down to work with George Miller um, on Happy Seat 2. Yeah. So I thought, oh, it'll be be an adventure. Come down, work for a couple of years with a director I really admire, uh, and then, you know, head back to California. But as it's turned out, I'm still here. Yeah, you like it? I do. Yeah, I do. Uh, after working with George, I moved to a company called Animal Logic, mm-hmm. and it's been great. Uh, they originally attracted me because they were in pre-production on a film called The Lego Movie. And ah, I've heard of it. Being a <laughs> being a fan of Lego, I, and they they were interested in having me come aboard. Oh uh, yeah! And they showed me that they showed me their test, and it was amazing. It was incredible. So I was like, okay. I had to go back to the family, and say we're not moving back to San Rafael <laughs> or to California. Yeah. Uh, we're staying so that Dad can work on a Lego movie. And then it rolled into Lego Batman, and then that rolled into Peter Rabbit, and um, yeah. And now the family loves it here so much. I think you know we're here at least for a while, or for quite a while, I would say. There you if go. Not forever. I've always wanted to go to Australia just to say I've been on the other side of the planet. Right. I haven't made it yet. No, well, you should try. It's a nice yeah, place. Once uh, this whole thing blows over and we're allowed to travel again, uh, you should definitely put it on your list. Done. Done. Have you been to New Zealand yet? I have. It's a gorgeous country. Is Absolutely it? fabulous. Oh, yeah. It goes so yeah. bad. I love Lord of the Rings. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, they market it. They marketed uh, Air New Zealand for a while with Lord of the Rings. I think they had it painted right on the side of the planes. I think. No, oh, really. It's, um, Smart. it's an amazing country. I mean, you can see why Peter Jackson was able to get all his locations there because they have mountains and they have beaches and they have beautiful, you know, forests and everything. And he was able to shoot the films there. And it's it's all compacted into these two gorgeous islands. It's amazing. Have you been to both? I have. Yeah. Oh, cool. Is one, I'm assuming one has got to be more populated than the other, because that's usually how things are. Well, I I can't say that I've been all over the country, uh, and I tend to be in cities. So, uh, you know, Auckland and Wellington are in the North Island, and those are the places I spent most of my time. Oh, okay, okay. That's where Hobbiton is as well, I believe. One day. Well, one day. One day I'll make it. So you're not from Australia, because you do not have an accent. (laughs) No, I'm from Canada. (laughs) Whoa, what? Canada? That's yes. not even that's not even California, which is where Okay, hold on. No. You're from Canada? No, born, what part of Canada? Bor- born and raised in Toronto and went to university in Montreal. No way. That's cool. So you're pretty good with yeah. the cold then. 
<laughs> Probably not anymore. <laughs> I certainly was for a long time. No, I think uh, I think one's ability to deal with the the deep freeze, uh, you know, it goes away. It it, it goes away. Yeah, there was a <laughs> there was a winter that I went back uh, just after oh, no. Christmas one year, and it was negative thirty Celsius. I only talk Celsius now, so it's. Huh. Uh, uh, oh, I can't do the conversion. It's very, very cold. cold. <laughs> so I'd left. I'd left Sydney uh, with the family. It was thirty degrees positive, which is like you know a hundred and something. Uh, and then it was negative thirty when we landed in Toronto. So that was a sixty degree difference. That was huge. Oh, good yeah, lord! Just, yeah, yeah. But no, I get so grew grew up there, loved it there, and then moved to the states. Actually, when ILM hired me in nineteen ninety three. You went from Canada to ILM. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. Pretty yeah. good, Rob. Not bad. Yeah. Well, I was studied <laughs> animation in Montreal at yeah. Concordia University. Um, this all predates computer animation. And then I was working in animation in Toronto uh, in computer animation. And then at that point, um, what was, would have been May of 93, Jurassic Park came out. I saw the film. I was like, Ooh. oh, my God. Yeah. And I that did it for you a know, lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I knew about ILM. ILM probably came onto my radar, oh, honestly, probably between Empire and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, yeah, you know, I I was the right age for the first Star Wars, so I was thirteen years old in seventy seven to go see the, the first Star Wars film, and uh, you know, then I went to see Empire Strikes Back, and then Raiders of the you Lost in. Ark. Uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, cause I was, I remember going to that and, um, and, uh, the pattern had already shown up. It was Lucas and Spielberg and it was also this company called industrial light and magic. And I didn't honestly, you know, connect to that. I would be doing, you know, or even dream that I would be doing it in the future, but it was, it was certainly something I started to pay attention to and the, and the work they were doing was incredible. And so it was definitely on my radar from that point on. Sure. So were you into like art and stuff as a kid or like when did Yeah, that's the connect? Yeah, I mean I was a, always a kid who drew and I was uh, you know cartooning all the time. Uh I went to cool. an all boys school uh in Toronto and we didn't have an art program at least not from my not from my um class. Uh there were art for the younger for the you know younger kids at the school, but uh, sure. I started that school from grade 7 and back then we went to grade 13. So oh, I wow. went from seven to grade 13 there and we didn't have art, but I was always, you know, drawing and, and doing posters and things like that. And I had a little comic strip in the school newspaper. Um, but I didn't That's get actually cool. formal art training until I got to university. Um, and then yeah. I sort of, you know, I just, it was so great. <laughs> it was just yeah. something that I loved, uh, you know, being around people who were actually, you know, teaching me how to you know, do different techniques and different types of of art was fabulous. Sure, I bet. That's really cool. And like you kind of did your own thing and they're like, maybe I'll actually try this. That's cool. Well, uh, that's the thing. I mean, the, the timing was such that I was in Montreal when the very first beta versions of a animation software called Softimage had come out. Oh. And we were introduced to that. And it turned out um, that... ILM was using both Softimage and an animation package out of Toronto called uh, Alias okay. um, to do modeling and animation. Um, so I, in Montreal, I started to get really interested in computer animation. I'd taken some uh, computer science course at high school. Mm -hmm. I was really fascinated with computers. I wanted to make art with computers, uh, but this was too cost prohibitive at that time. I couldn't afford my own computer until way after I'd graduated I bet. university. Um, so it was only, you know, and we had no computer animation at university. And it was not until I moved back to Toronto and started working that I got access to these big silicon graphic machines and the state of the art uh, animation and modeling packages that then I was like absolutely immersed and worked on things like um, Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future, which was a television show beautiful that had live act real people but with computer animated um well, robots um, oh sweet that, that that was an amazing learning experience and i worked with some great people there and that that then set me up to really see uh, you know confirm to me that this is something i really really want to do yeah was it one of those things that like 
you because when you get access to something like was there a learning curve you're like i don't know what this is but let's see if it does this like that had to have been right oh Oh yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, 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 yeah. But I was, it was so exciting. I mean, I joked about in the early days there were fingerprints all over my monitor because I just wanted to reach into the <laughs> into the computer and just position the character the way I wanted instead of fighting with it all the time. But yeah. truthfully, there was a one day where I, you know, this is after many months, if not probably years, where I'd been working and then suddenly I noticed there were no fingerprints on the screen, Ooh. that the, the edges of the screen had disappeared completely. I was able to maneuver <laughs> and manipulate the characters the way I wanted without thinking about it, that I'd become fluent in the software. Uh, this would be Saftamash at the time. And I could get it to do anything I wanted. And that was around the time that I applied to ILM in 1993. There you go. That is hilarious. You had your marker. It's like, how dirty is the screen? Just wait for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was something I thought about later on, but it was true. I mean, I look, I wanted to be a stop motion animator, but I wasn't good enough. Um, sure. Stop, stop motion animation, you have to position the character you know, every couple of frames, and you're, you're, you're doing what we call straight ahead animation. Mm-hmm. And there'd be bits of my animation, which would be great. And you could be filming this thing for days, right? And then you'd send the film off to the lab and then it would come back and you'd say, right, so that middle five seconds wasn't bad, but the other three was really, really bad, yeah, <laughs> really oh, yeah. bad. Yeah. So, and then you got to start all over again oh, yeah. in puppet animation. And that's why I got attracted to computer animation, because to me, it was key frameable stop motion animation, because they are they are puppets, they have armatures, it's all digital inside. Um, but you can position them in three space relative to the digital camera Mm -hmm. and then do your performances. And so to me, uh, that I I could do because I could, I could set down my keyframes, you know, spread out over time and then go into what we call in betweening, which is then you set breakdown positions. You're looking at the arcs of like a a wrist moving through space, Mm -hmm. and then you could massage that and get the performance that you wanted. And so that's why I was attracted to computer animation. That's pretty cool. You like got to do stop motion without the the <laughs> finding out after a few days that you messed up. That's pretty nice. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would not have. I, I have an, such admiration for people who do stop motion animation, and I love stop motion Same. films because of the the tactile nature of them, the materials they use, the way the characters tend to move. It's they're just beautiful films. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And then when you see those like time lapses of the behind the scenes of like cool Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, yeah, true. Those oh. yeah, those those are some of my favorite things to see. Same. I mean, that's you know, look, that's truthfully one of the reasons I was attracted to the Lego movie because the whole premise was uh and this was set up by um the director's Lord Miller yeah. was that they um they wanted the audience to believe that they were seeing real Lego bricks being moved around. Yeah. So great care was put into the modeling and surfacing and the surfacing in that the, they weren't perfect computer generated bricks. That They were designed and painted to be scuffed up and chipped and warped and all those things so that when we were moving them around in our animation, uh, we were also thinking about what we call the brick films, the real films that are made with real bricks. And we were trying, we were looking at those and saying, okay, what's the, what is it about the nature of real stop motion animation and brick animation that, you know, what can we distill out of that and put into our computer animation, brick animation? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's like a whole extra level that people might not have picked up on. That's neat. Well, I mean, uh, that it was that, that attention, the detail that really attracted me to the project and really had me excited about the project because, you know, someone who played with Lego as a kid, oh, yeah. you're in your own little world and they, they they move in a particular way. So when we started animating, we would pick up the minifigs and actually, you know, tick tock them across the desk and, okay, so what would a walk cycle look like and how would they jump or fight and what can we do? Um, because one of the rules for our film was no bending, uh, you know, the bricks don't bend, so Ooh. no bre- bending, right. but we would do things where like we would separate the bricks, say between the leg bricks and the chest bricks, we would just open that up just momentarily for a couple of frames to get a little bit of stretch mm-hmm. or squash, but it wasn't actually squashing at all. It was just clicking back together, but run at speed at 24 frames a second, the audience felt or the hope was that they would feel some compression and some um, extra life there. Um, so that's that's what we did. That's so cool. That's so cool. What a fun movie. 
So then what so then yeah. what was the what was the process because you got into animation so early on in the technology like back then what would you have to do like what is what is a day on on like the TV show you did Oh <laughs> what's a day like yeah. Uh well I mean it's actually very very similar to what we still do I mean we really? would model we we yeah yeah because you're still um everything happens faster now and, yeah, it of doesn't, course. and the computers are so <laughs> much quicker um but honestly we we started the same way we start now which is we built the characters well they were designed first it always starts with art and design so mm -hmm. those those designs back then were done on paper um and we were using a software on the captain power which had been used on uh the movie tron sweet so that was this um synthivision uh and it was a boolean based the uh, booleans are like think of like cubes and spheres and cones that you can add and subtract from each other to create um, a unique piece of geometry. So okay. the characters on that show were built with a Boolean based system. They then are rigged. So they have bones put into them uh, or chains as they called them back then. So you're think of your own arm. So you have your shoulder, your elbow and your wrist. Those are three points of rotation. So those are added in to the character. That's the same thing we do nowadays. Uh, and then, once the character is rigged, then the animators can move it or position it. Um, and that's why I think of them as little armatures. An armature is an actual metal skeleton inside a real puppet, like you'd see in, say, Kubo or Box Trolls or things like that. Right. Uh, they've actually got a, a puppet that will, you can move its arm, and, the, and when you let go, the arm will stay in that position, which is vital if you're going to step frame or stop motion these characters that over 24 frames uh, a second to get them to appear to it's the illusion of life as yeah, we call it. So yeah. you, you're breathing life into these characters, same idea in computer animation, but our armatures are digital and the, the puppets are inside the computer or we can see them and we can tumble around them on the screen with our mouse. Um, but the, the idea is exactly the same. That's so cool. It's like the basics and <laughs> fundamentals are just that regardless like they stand the test of time and then you build on it with better tools and stuff like that yeah i mean this is you know this goes back to being a, a kid and being inspired by ray harryhausen yeah and what he was doing with his characters is exactly what we're doing and one of the cool things in my life is i got to meet ray and show him what we were doing at what? ilm and have him sit at my desk yeah Dude. yeah so that was you know, and he was like, ah, I'm totally baffled by what you guys are doing, you know, but I was like, no, 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 Ray, it's exactly the same. And I showed him and it, and it, and it was, it's just that, you know, uh, he was, he was hand moving all those skeletons, you know, fighting or, you know, whatever character he was doing. Yeah. Um, Dude. So it, it goes back to that. I mean, it goes back to what, 1933 King Kong. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the same, it's the same idea. Uh, but but what we what we can do now is we can put in all kinds of tiny detail fidelity micro movements say even the face where they didn't have that on those puppets they just didn't have the level of of control just the nature of how the puppets were built they didn't get those little micro move or couldn't get those little micro movements think of like a lower lid twitching or, or yeah. uh, just a little tiny eye scan we can put that into our computer animation because we can zoom in that close and we have those, um, uh, you know, those setups and tools on our facial rigs. That's so cool. Hey, do you ever just sit back and think that like Harry Housen sat at your desk one time? Like, do you, do, <laughs> like how do you, how do you even yeah. process that? <laughs> uh, look, I'm one of the lucky ones. I was, uh, you know, as animation director on the star Wars films when Ray came through. So I got to meet Ray and I also got to meet Chuck Jones and, Dude. Those those guys were so inspirational to me as a kid. To, yeah. So, yeah, look, I, I never I honestly never thought I would get to where I got to. Um, and so once I did and I got the opportunity to meet these legends, it was just um, it was amazing. It was fantastic. And it's a connection to the, you know, to the previous people and uh, who'd worked in animation. And same thing with Richard Williams. I became uh, I went to one of Richard Williams' first classes in animation, which was what? just amazing in San Francisco. ILM sent us, and then he then created his videos. His they were that region, originally released on DVD, and then his book, and then his app. And over the years, I became um, you know uh, I, we corresponded, and then so we became friends. Um, and it was. 
he he always talked about uh you know what he did in the 1970s bringing in some of the disney animators and warner brothers animators yeah uh was that you know they had the connection and the knowledge back to the nine old men and then Richard was the guy who was passing it on to us. And so, yeah, the timing of me coming into this business, I'm a lucky, lucky guy. I got to meet these people. And because of, um, you know, my interaction with, with Richard Williams, I have a, you know, one degree of separation yeah. back to <laughs> Milt Call. you know? Yeah. I would never have met Milt Call, And, but because of Richard and what he's shared with the whole world, we all got to hear stories, how Milt worked and the, his, you know, the, the amazing, skill that he had as a draftsman, but also just performance and everything. And you look at that stuff and I can continually go back to his book, Richard, Will- Richard Williams's book. Yeah. Um, Cause it's such a treasure trove for any animators who are out there. It's, it's, it truly is the Bible for us. That's so awesome. It's like, I imagine like martial artists, you know, they're like the, a big thing with them is like lineage. It's like, I got a black belt sure. from this person who learned from this person who learned from this person. And like, yeah. you're in Same that thing. for animation. They're like, well, this exactly. Thing. That's, that's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, um, that's so, cool. so that's, that's, yeah. yeah. So, so was movies always the goal? Uh, look, you know what? I remember, uh, going out for pizza after in 1981 with my dad and my brother after we saw Raiders of the Lost Ark and we were all super excited about that film. And it was at that dinner that my dad said, you know, you love movies. Maybe one day you work in the movies and maybe, maybe one day you'll even work for George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and this is in Toronto, Canada. Right. And I'm like, dad, that's never going to happen. He but knew. you know, what I took away from that is that my dad was like, look, you can do anything you can put your, that you put your mind to. Yeah. Uh, in no way was there then a, a direct vector to, Oh, and I get hired by ILM. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but what it did was, uh, I originally went off to university for, to study journalism. Actually, I didn't oh. go into animation for my first really? year. No, because it was a, it was, you know, I, even at 18 years old, I didn't really connect to, you can do this as a career. Right. I kind of had made crummy little super eight movies. Uh, I was certainly fascinated in animation. I went to visual effects and animation films all the time. I studied all that stuff. I was interested in computers, but I still hadn't made the connection sure. until, I was sitting in journalism class in my first year and I was like, what am I doing here? This is, I'm not happy here. <laughs> like, Why didn't I do right? something that's going to make me happy? Right. So I changed universities. I went from Ottawa to Montreal and um, applied to Concordia where I had an interview and I, because they, you know, I'd never had art in high school. I had to put some, put a portfolio together. And anyways, long story short, they gave me a position in the program. And from that point I haven't looked back and dude, uh, I, I I wanted to be in animation. Actually, my goal was to work for the National Film Board of Canada, which I ended up doing really? uh, in 1989. Yeah, in 1988-89. Um, growing up in Canada, of course, we see all the Disney and Warner Brothers films, but what we also get are all the amazing short animations out of the Film Board. Um, film Board was founded in 1939. Wow. Uh, with, uh, with the um, desire to create live action and animated films to show Canadians about other parts of Canada that they wouldn't get to. So it has a long tradition of amazing documentaries and uh, just an incredible variety of animated shorts in all different techniques. So there's puppet animation, sand animation, paint on glass animation, hand-drawn animation. Really? And to me, that was incredibly uh, inspiring because as I, as I said earlier, I was a kid who drew, but I didn't have the drafting skills. I would never have been hired by uh, Disney or Warner Brothers. I just didn't have those skills. But the film board had stuff that was rough around the edges, but was still incredibly entertaining. And um, so that was a goal. So then anyways, I ended up working at the film board under uh, an amazing director, Derek Lamb. Uh, and, uh, and that was, that was the goal. So then once that was done, I was like, okay, now what? <laughs> uh, now I want to work in, in computer animation. <laughs> well, actually I had been working in computer animation before that, but I want to get back into doing that. And, um, so I did, so that was 89 to 93. And then, yeah. So then just watching what ILM was doing, it's like, oh, yeah, they're the pinnacle. I gotta, you know, I, I gotta at least try. I mean, that was the good thing about how I was brought up. It's like, you gotta try, you know? So I never thought they would call me back, but I still put <laughs> together the portfolio and the resume and the covering letter and sent it off to California thinking, okay, well, 
I've applied. Right. Uh, Wipe your I won't hands get in, it. but at least if I applied. Yeah. yeah. But then they called back, and then oh. I got an interview. Oh, that's nuts. Mm-hmm. You, you peaked early, Rob. That's what happened. You're like, well, <laughs> no. now what? <laughs> now, no. so there was, just to put it into perspective, there were six animators on Jurassic Park in 1993. Um, wow. Kyle Balda, who's been directing those uh, Minions films for Illumination, he was number seven. My good friend David Andrews was number eight, and I was number nine hired at ILM as animator. So Dude. it was a small group. I think the entire computer graphics department in, in at ILM at that time was around 50 people. Ooh. So, uh, man. Yeah, it was it was an amazing time. And of course, as soon as I got there, I was like, I'm not worthy. Oh, my God. How did I get here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not as good as these guys. Yeah. Of course. Of course. You got to have a little bit of imposter syndrome. Otherwise, what are you doing? You know? Oh my! I had it for six months. I I was having a hard time. Uh, yeah, and, and my whole strategy actually was to work on some of the smaller films, uh, sort of. So I went off and worked on things like um, I don't know, Disclosure and um, um, what was the other ones? The smaller ones I worked on. You had to cut your teeth. Um, yeah, well, I just wanted to because I, oh, that's the other thing. So when I applied, uh, my skills were in modeling, rigging, and animation. And so I came in as a generalist. But ILM very quickly told me, you have to pick a special a specialty. Oh, so, no. um, yeah, so I, because otherwise I wouldn't be at the same level as the other animators. I ended up picking animation, obviously. But the sure. but I was sad to, to give up my modeling and, and rigging skills because um, you need that when you're in a smaller studio, as I did in Canada. Um, but you... The, the brilliance of an ILM is that you build it on specialists. So you have the best modelers, the best riggers, the best animators, right. et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. That makes sense. So you don't want a jack of all trades, master of none. You would want to put masters involved <laughs> in the in the thing. Well, yeah, not when you're not when you're up at the top of, of, of the pack. Yeah. Which, uh, <laughs> at least ILM at least ILM in the nineteen nineties was that way. Oh, for uh, sure. You know, I certainly you know, it 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 will always serve you well to have skills across multi multi disciplines. So mm-hmm. in no way am I telling people here, j- you know, only be an animator. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you will be a better animator. You will be a better animator if you understand rigging. Right, right. And you'll be more useful to the studio if you understand, you know, modeling. But I'm, I'm focused on what we call the f- front part of the pipeline. There's also the people who do the back end of the pipeline. So these are people who do you know, lighting effects and compositing. So there's there's individuals who do that stuff. So I'm only talking from my own experience, but being able to um, work within a team where you understand what's required and the the workload of your colleagues is incredibly vital too. So I am so I'm suggesting to any listeners who are out there and early in their careers, you do want to be a uh, you know you will be well served if you're a generalist and you may get to a big studio one day where you need to specialize and then in that case then you do sure sure man i l m out the gate dude deep end <laughs> deep end why not you know you canada's cold you know what else is cold <laughs> imposter syndrome but that's awesome <laughs> Man, and from 93, too. That's like when it was like the calm before the storm, which was like right after Jurassic Park, which kind of changed everything. Like yeah. like King Kong was like the thing that everyone was like, oh, man, this is crazy. Let's get into that. But then I feel like the next wave of that was Jurassic Park because we'd never seen anything like that before, uh, you know? Oh, well, I would I would, I would, would say Terminator 2 and Abyss Ooh, were certainly ramping, yep. ramping us up to that point. You're right. I, I would... You're right. I would I would definitely say now though both of those are ILM again, but the, but no, I would say there was a whole ramp heading up to to Jurassic, but Jurassic still is, uh, you know, it it holds up so well. It does. The work was incredibly sophisticated for that time, and I know the technology we were using back then, so it was very laborious right. as well. <laughs> and the the polish on that work is breathtaking. Yeah, yeah. So, do you, what was the first movie you worked on at ILM? Do you remember it? First film uncredited was uh, Flintstones. Oh. Uh, the first shot I was given, the first shot I was given, was Dino conga line dancing behind Elizabeth Taylor. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's part of the I'm not worthy because that was an incredibly <laughs> difficult shot. I bet. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I only worked on that one shot, and 
I can say now I did not do a very good job because uh, it was so complicated. There was a character behind Dino and a character in front of Dino. And they, when they shot the live action, those two people, real people, kept drifting apart from each other. Oh, no. So there wasn't a consistent space. So trying to keep Dino's hands on someone's hips while this other person. So I had to keep stretching Dino back when they separated or crunching him in between when they were closer. It, it, it was a... Uh, it was a difficult shot, but that was the uh, yeah, that was the the first one that I worked on. Wow, that's a lot of work. And like, just <laughs> you'll figure it out. You got this. So when you're when you're yeah. like, what's the process and something like that? Because you have the shot is a shot, and then you have to yeah. digitally animate it into the shot and not have it like it's got to fit in the space. It's like, are you painting out the things in the shot? How does it even work? There's uh, well, in that particular case, I came in late in the production because I am had already been working on it. So I can't tell you, but it's the specifics up front. But what I can guess is they would have storyboarded out or planned that they're going to do this shot and the Dino was going to be in it. There would have been a visual effects supervisor on set who may have had a stand in momentary or, you know, for a take or two standing in for Dino. They would then have removed Dino. Oh, and that was used. That would have been used for the actors to get a sense of the spacing. Mm -hmm. Then they would have taken that stand in out and they would have then shot this the scene with the space left for where Dino would be. Then that plate, we call it a plate, that that footage would have been edited and then sent to ILM, scanned in, because it would have been in film back then, mm -hmm. would have been scanned in and then brought online. It would then have gone to the layout team who would have then created a digital camera to match the real camera that was there. So how high was it? What was the lens? Uh, what was the tilt angle, et cetera? Mm -hmm. That then goes into a, it would have been at that point, it would have been a soft image scene. The layout people would have just roughly placed in a non-animating Dino just for size placement. Oh. And then it would have been given to me. So the, the anim supervisor on the show would have... Um, you know, you know, sat me down or taking me through it and said, okay, this is what we want. And he needs to be following the action and he needs to be enjoying himself or whatever the direction was for that shot. Uh, and then I start animating and it could take me, well, I, I don't remember now, but it would have <laughs> taken me many, many days Ooh. to block in, to block in that animation. And I was probably on that shot for a couple of weeks. Uh, that's all back in the fog of time now. So yeah. I don't remember the specifics <laughs> of that first shot. I remember being terrified and I remember having imposter syndrome. I bet. I bet. But I also remember how diff difficult the shot was. Um, but yeah, so that was my introduction. But, I, but what was great was every day we would get together for dailies in the main theater at ILM and I would see everyone else's work. So other animators work, but I also see the lighting and effects. Oh. And I was just blown away. I was like, how oh, can I be here? These people are so gifted. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't show mine. Just get mine. Just get mine. <laughs> yeah, but it was also, uh, you know, it's like anything. It's like playing tennis. You play with someone who's better than you, you're going to get better. So I was around people that were a lot better than me and I got better a lot, you know, quickly, very quickly. Sure. Because the, the attention to detail that I was asked to do on, say, the commercial TV commercial work I was doing in Toronto compared to doing feature film quality animation was like night and day. Um, really? <clears throat> we would spend a day or two on shots for TV commercials, uh, and then we would move on to the next one. The next one, this was like, nope, do it again, yeah. do it again, <laughs> refine this, polish that. So that was, that was an eye-opener, too, and that took me a while to get used to that. Um, I was happy for it, grateful for it. And it was what inspired me to go there because I wanted my work to be better. Right. But I hadn't been, I hadn't had the opportunity in the type of work I was doing in Canada. So now I was at ILM doing, you know, top level work. Sure. Being like legit challenged and stuff all the time. So it's like you have no choice yeah. but to get better. It's trial by fire. Yeah. Yeah. That's so I don't remember exactly chronologically, but I know the mask was a big opportunity as Ooh. well. So I worked on the, the first mask what? as well. What'd you do on that? As an, as an animator. I love that movie. Uh, a whole bunch of different shots. A whole bunch of different shots. Um, I love that you work on a uh, shot at a time. Like that's a, I feel like, oh, average, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like the average person doesn't like know that that animators, it's like you have a shot, a specific shot, not like here's an entire sequence. It's like, nope, shot. It, yeah. It can yeah well back then it was shot shot shot. Uh, nowadays, like on Peter Rabbit, we would give a number of shots. So we might do we might even give you like four or five shots in a row. So you get a, a run oh. as we say. 
so that so the performance stays consistent because now just switching hats now i'm as an animation supervisor yeah one of your one of your biggest challenges is and uh you know we have big teams now we had 85 animators on peter rabbit 2 is you've got you've got a team of people and I, I and i interview and hire them all so i know what they've done before and i get a, a sense of their technical and creative uh, skills, but it's not until I start actually working with them, I, I then see, okay, what, what are the shots that they're better suited for? But one of the biggest challenges as an animation supervisor is you might have, one may have 40 animators animating Peter Rabbit on any given day. And each animator has a slightly different understanding of how the character moves or what their uh... face does, or, you know, and your role uh, as a supervisor is to help guide them to a consist- consistent performance that the audience can't see the hands of these different people touching the character. They, they just believe and see one character alive on the screen. Right. Um, so, you know, the people have used the analogy. It's like herding cats. It is a bit <laughs> like that, I guess. Not that I've ever herded any cats, but I, you know, people do head off in different directions. Yeah. Yeah. There's people with all the best intentions uh, show you an animation and you just, you instantly know it's not, it doesn't fit within the style of the movie. Yep. Characters uh, too broad or too car- cartoony for a film that's in stylized realism, as I call Peter Rabbit. Love it. Or vice versa. Or it's, you know, the, the face isn't as engaging as it could be. All of those things. So you're tweaking the performances uh, with the animators. You're coaching them, uh, and you're you certainly you're using other shots as examples. So once we get some of our most senior animators producing some of the best performances early on, and the, then the director is saying, "This is my character." We then uh, that that work is then, of course, shown to the more mid level and junior animators, so that they we, we say, "Okay." This is this is the bar. We're all going for going over this bar now. This is this is the level of performance. This is the level of acting. This is the way he moves, walks, talks. Right, right. Oh, that's so cool. That's a that's a lot of pressure. It can be. I'm... <laughs> these <laughs> these movies do cost a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, yes, certainly on the big Hollywood films. You know, the studios and executives, as well as directors, editors, producers. So. Yeah, I, that's the thing that you learn on the job is the, um, you know, as an animation director or supervisor, you're a key player on a on an animated or a live action animated hybrid, as we call them, film. Yeah. Where you're, you know, you're trying to get, you're trying to do your best to get the director's vision onto the screen. But even before you do that, you have to learn, you have to build a relationship with them and understand when they say something, what do they mean by that? Right. You know, so what is their, what's their vocabulary? What are their worries about the performances? Uh, because a lot of animation, when it start, you start off, we, we use the term blocking when you position the characters roughly. Right. A lot of directors don't know how to read that and they get, they get nervous because they're not sure how far you are along in your creative process. And so, Part of my role is to also coach them on that and teach them about that and and show them, say, okay, this is what rough blocking looks like. This is what a work in progress check-in animation looks like. This is what a polished animation will end up looking like. Um, And so once they see that, then they can be more comfortable. They then, I am always encouraging them to talk to the animators as if they're the other actors on the movie, because they are. Right. They're actors that are behind the scene. Absolutely. But talk to them in a, in a performance way. You know, I want to feel this from the, or, you know, that the character's thinking about something, or I want the audience to be sad, you know, with the character at this this moment. Or I want um, to this and this character to be questioning non-verbally what's being said to them. Um, yeah. and, and you can do that, you know, all uh, in the in the face, but also the body, and so um, we we talk about that kind of stuff all the time, and that really is the difference between nowadays and my early days of animation. Early days of animation, my recollection, it was all technical. Yeah, how to fix something that's <laughs> broken, how to stop gimbal lock where something is twisted around, how to get the feet to lock to the floor. We yeah. don't talk about that stuff really anymore. Oh. I mean, that's uh, we can now focus on. Uh, the subtleties of performance. Um, All right, little nuance. There's certainly people worried about the technical things. We still have technical problems. We still have renders that blow up and don't work. Yeah. We have, <laughs> you know, a- animation rigs that, um, you know, that we have we struggle with. But, but um, 
an animator's day in day out should be thinking about uh, performance and acting. That makes so much sense. And I, I never thought about that. They're like, yeah, you guys are, it's, a, it's an inanimate thing that you guys are creating and then moving, but there's still performance side of it. Like it needs to convey Absolutely. and like, oh, I just never put those two and two together. That's amazing. Well, you, as an animator, you're trying to breathe life into, yeah, as you said, an inanimate object. Yeah. Uh, and so we're, animators tend to be, you know, good observers of life, whether it be humans or animals or both. Um, we, I think the best animators in the world are sensitive to the little subtle, uh, we, I talked about it earlier, the micro movements in, in people's faces. Um like what does a face look like when you're you're super happy about something and then you, someone tells you something that's not so great? How yeah. does your face fall? What does that actually look like? Because from the day we're born, we're we study, we're, you know, we're looking at a human faces. So as human beings, we we know all those little those little signals and those little nonverbal things. And so what I'm trying to remind the animators a lot of time is just tap back into that. You know what that looks like in real life. Yeah. So now you are trying to replicate that in the face of your animated character, whether it be Emmett as a little brick, by the way, or it's Peter <laughs> who's got a full, fully articulating face, you know? Yeah. One of the concerns on, on Lego movie was would the audience feel empathy for Emmett? And for the people who've seen the movie, um, it's great. there's a scene when he, he meets the, you know, we called him bad cop, right? you yeah. know, but the, <laughs> who's interrogating him and, and Emmett's all super cheerful and everything. And he says something along the lines of, well, ask my friends, they'll tell you I'm, I'm not a master criminal. Yeah. <laughs> and the cop says, oh, we did. And then he cuts to a bunch of video of, of his friends and the construction workers going, that guy? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> and it keeps cutting back to Emmett and slowly Emmett's face falls. And you have to remember, Emmett's face is two black dots and a black line for his mouth. That's it. Yeah. But the animator did such an amazing job that we feel empathy. The camera is slowly pushing in on his little face. And we as audience members are absolutely in that moment. We have a willing suspension of dis disbelief. We believe that Emmett's alive, but, and not only that, but he's he is he's hearing that these people who he thought were his friends aren't maybe his friends or aren't saying the nicest things about him. Right, and he's not saying a word, and it's all nonverbal, and it's just a it's just beautiful section of shots in that film. So, you know, it it's it's um. It's amazing what humans will do, you know, audience members, that is, in terms of, you know, we can do stuff in animation. They're like, yep, I believe it. Yep, yeah. I believe it. It's like, <laughs> great. Then we've done our job. Yeah, I love that. It's so weird how the human brain works. Like when you think about like a Muppet, you just get like the tennis, mm -hmm. like the ping pong balls, put black spots in the middle. Oh, and yeah. Like, Those are eyes. You're like, what? Oh, yeah. It's so strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love yeah, that. no, some of my favorite of those are when you go back and you look at uh, Kermit talking to little kids, like little, little kids, oh, yeah. they absolutely believe he is alive because Jim Henson had such amazing control in his mouth or, or in Kermit's mouth. Yeah, Kermit's eyes don't even blink. You know, if you think about it, right? His, <laughs> they don't change. They don't do eye scan. You know, right. they don't move. It's all in Kermit's body and the way that his mouth moves yep. and the way that his head tilts. It's incredible. Like I agree. Chuck Jones talked about, uh, you know, one of the, his favorite characters to animate because he had no mouth was Marvin the Martian. Oh, you know, he was a character had no mouth. You're you know, right. and we just uh, Kermit's got eyes that don't move. Yeah. <laughs> and yet we will connect with these characters. That's what I love about this stuff. Yeah, it's the it's the magic behind it. Like I think about uh, yeah. uh, Mike Quinn was on the show a while back and he said that um, the reason he loves puppets is they're essentially live action cartoons. And it's like yeah. this whole, it's, yeah. it's just magic. It's so magic. And I love it. Yeah. I love it so much. Yeah. 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 I mean, or certainly years ago, I had studied a bunch of what um, Jim was doing uh, with his Muppets and how their heads move forward and back and how he chose to move his hand while doing dialogue. Yeah. And then I was very, very lucky, obviously, to work with Frank Oz yep. uh, on Yoda. And so I studied a lot of what Frank had done before meeting Frank. And then when I got to meet Frank and was then talking to him, he then held his naked hand up and showed me what? how his fingers were positioned inside Yoda's head and how he moved his fingers around. And then that informed me on how I wanted the animators to animate the digital Yoda. Oh, that's uh, so cool. Being respectful of what was done in The Empire Strikes Back, but then modernizing it enough uh, with computer animation 
but our early tests, honestly, they, they he moved around too much. His mouth, his his face was too articulate. It was it had too broad a range of motion, and it looked creepy and weird. It looked like this little <laughs> green guy, green monster, and didn't have the charm of the puppet from Empire. So we went and studied Empire, both verbal and nonverbal shots. And in fact, people can watch me presenting that work on the. Um, uh, I think it's the Attack of the Clones disc. There, yeah. That's the actual meeting where I took the footage up that people like Hal Hickel worked on. He's amazing. Um, he is. And uh, and for me, it was, it was almost more important to do the nonverbal shots. Would we stay engaged with a computer-generated Yoda uh, and believe that he was still alive and thinking? Yeah. Because... There's, t- there's a tendency or it can happen where computer animated characters can go a little dead in the face, specifically in the eyes, sure. if they're not constantly moving. And and being able to rein that in, but in just doing little micro movements and little things that we see in in people, uh, you know, when they're listening, it was that kind of um, subtlety that I wanted us to put into those tests. And those were the tests that then convinced George that we would be able to do a digital Yoda uh, he knew that we were going to, well, he, he had told me he, we needed to have one for Yoda versus Dooku, but I wanted us to be able to do full Yoda, all the talking and performing as well. And that's why we did that test. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So when you're doing, because I, I know you worked, you did Indian in the Cupboard, which I loved. Yes. Yeah, I did the, I did the. I did the uh, the T Rex. I animated the T Rex in the cupboard. Oh, it's so cool, dude! I love. I know, I know. Cool. I was like, they were like, "Oh, we want you to work on that." That's the first time I actually got to talk to Frank because uh, Frank Oz because he directed that film. Yeah, yeah, that made me think of it. That's so cool. And then you worked on Dragonheart, which the tongue is still at ILM, which is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> is it up on the wall? It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, it used to be in one of the big animator rooms in San Rafael ILM. Um, That's funny. So, yeah. Now so it's near the elevator. Cool. Oh my goodness! Yeah, did that I touch it? So gross. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Dragonheart was incredible. Uh, the anim supervisor on that film, uh, James Strauss, was uh, one of the six animators on Jurassic Park, and just an incredibly gifted animator. I learned so much from him. Um, that's cool. And that was that's that's one of the great things, uh, as I said earlier. I mean, you're around people that are so much better than you, and James certainly fit the bill there. He was. Um, he was an inspiration to all of us. So, yeah. and Dragonheart was a, lot, a really fun show to work on. Sean, you know, animating Sean Connery's voice. You know, yeah. I did a shot like, I yes, I yes, I yeah. am the last one. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was one of my shots. You know, um, not a bad So job. to be able to do that, yes, thanks. <laughs> uh, he came to ILM. I didn't get to meet him. He was down in the in the. Yeah, we were all brought into the theater, and then he came in to say hello to us. And you know, that's what, amazing. What an amazing guy, dude. Yeah. Sean Connery. Look at that. Look at you killing it. <laughs> and then from there, you went to Men in Black, another big time favorite. Oh, man. Yeah, that, that was great. That was a huge opportunity for me. I uh, So near the end of Dragonheart, James got very sick and had to step away from the project. And I was asked oh. to step in and, and lead the team just in the final month or two. I don't remember exactly, but I had a... a um, got onto some people's radar, I guess, in management. And I was given the opportunity to be the anim supervisor on Dude. Men in Black. So that was a big, big step up for me. Um, and uh, I was uh, rejoined with Eric Brevig, the visual effects supervisor who I'd worked previously with on both. Uh, we were on Disclosure. He was a visual effects supervisor on that and Indian the Cupboard. Nice. So it was great to be back with Eric again. And um yeah, that film. I mean, Barry Sonnenfeld, such a character. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're right. You know, so it was a wacky film. And I got to spend a lot of time on set, which was fantastic because I was oh, there to cool. help co- coach um, Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith on how to interact with the animated characters. What? So, yeah. So Will was fantastic. He would come on every day and say hello to most, you know, everybody on the crew. He's like, hey, man, how's it going? Yeah. yeah um, cool. You know, hey, Rob, what, what what's up? Uh, kind of stuff but then it was uh tommy lee jones he kind of stayed in character the whole time and um there was one there was one particular day where we were shooting the scene when the bug swallows uh his character yes and tommy is standing out in the set and uh flailing his hands around you know 
And I'm sitting behind Barry Sonnefeld and I felt it was necessary to go forward to Barry and say, um, it's at this moment that the bug's mouth is going to be around his shoulders and he's going to be swallowed. So his arms can't be out anymore because they're going to be pushed down by the mouth of the character. Right. Uh, so if you could just remind him of that, that would be great. And Barry's <laughs> like, well, you go tell him. I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. You, you're the director. He goes, no, 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 you, you, go, you go tell him. So I walked it's out on the set, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> I walked out. I said, uh, so, "Excuse me, Mr. Jones. Uh, I, I'm the animation d- director on the show, and I just I was just noticing that you have your arms up." And he's like, he's walking closer and closer to me. He ends up like two inches from my nose, right, just staring into my face. Of course, and it's a blank, blank look. And I'm like, oh, uh, uh, so anyways, you know. And he just stares at me, and he goes, "Right, okay." And then he goes back. He does it perfectly every single time, you know. <laughs> but man, he scared me. You know, everyone was like, Barry is laughing. By the time I walked back, he's laughing. He's like, ah. That's hilarious. What you don't know is that's how he takes direction every time. He's got a. He has very. Well, the rumor. Hearing. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. No, no, no. I hear he's a character actor, and that he stays. He was still playing the that character who was who was a very stern character. Yeah. I yeah. don't pretend to know Tommy at all. That was my one and only interaction with him, but. He's a total pro when you watch him work. Like when they're doing the flashy thing in the eyes, you know, yeah. the light thing, the zapping people's memory. Uh-huh. I remember I was standing off off the side of the set and um, it was a moment when he gets zapped and um, and Barry said, OK, and they shot a couple and he blinked and he went, OK, now this time I don't want you to blink. And this is a super bright light. Right. Yeah. And so they shoot it. And he doesn't blink. I'm like, how do you have that kind of control yeah. over your eyes, right? <laughs> sure. He must have his his vision must be completely blocked out with just a, <laughs> a white screen, right? And there was another time where Barry gave him direction where he's like, okay, this is really great, Tommy. Uh, you're saying your line now. At this word, I want you to lift lift just your right eyebrow. And then they do the take, and he would do it. Okay, now let's do it with your left eyebrow up. And what? he would do it. It was just That's so cool. I never saw him flub. Yeah, I never saw him flub a take ever. Total pro. Um, and so, yeah, that was, I mean, the, I love being on set and watching the interaction between directors and actors and seeing what the different actors do and how they approach their work. So, um, yeah, that that was probably one of the most fun sets to be on, sure. Shannon Black, because right. certainly because of Will. Will was also a total pro. Oh, yeah. Will Smith would do the script as scripted for a few takes for, for Barry. And they'd say, can I, can I just ad lib one or two? And then he'd do it and they would just be hilarious. <laughs> and more times than not, Barry Sonnenfeld would ruin the take from laughing, you know? <laughs> uh, and the rest of the crew, me included, we're all standing there, you know, with our hands clasped over our mouths because Will was just so funny. Oh, I love that dude. Big hero, big hero. I love Will Smith. <laughs> That's so funny. You got to you got to semi direct Tommy Lee Jones. Look I you. didn't direct Tommy Look Lee Jones. You. I did not direct. I mean, I did not. You kind of <laughs> no. said, "Listen, try this a little." No, I'll give it to you. No. <laughs> Barry Barry was clearly having a bit of fun with me. <laughs> yeah, fun fact: Tommy Lee Jones is still blind from that flash. Uh, yeah, that's exactly. that's not true. Uh, so, Men in Black that was like ninety six, ninety seven, I believe. So then, episode one was ninety nine. So I'm wondering, yeah, how does someone convince I you went, to take on Star Wars? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So the rumor was that um, George Lucas had seen Men in Black. Oh, um, nice. And had talked to Jim Morris, who was then running ILM, who's uh, he's at Pixar, has been at Pixar for years now. But he was a real mentor of mine, and um, he was a president of ILM. And so I got, I have to remember the exact order of this. I got the call from Jim, I think, and went um, to his office in San Rafael and said, and he said, look, you're, um, we want to put you forward to be the animation supervisor on, uh, and it wasn't called The Phantom Menace at the time, it was just episode one. Right. He said, so they're already over in the UK, um, shooting so i want you to go over and you're going to spend a bunch of time with george and then we're going to see if you're a good fit uh, <laughs> and i was like what i was like um uh but i've never met george and <laughs> he's gonna think you know he won't know if i'm you know a courier or someone else or right and uh, i said you know jim it'd be really great if you would introduce me to george 
Smart. And, and then, you know, I'd feel more comfortable. And he immediately said, yep, okay, yep, absolutely. So we flew over together and we went to Leavesden where they were shooting mm-hmm. and um, walked out on set and waited for a moment. And um, that's when I met uh, George Lucas and Rick McCallum. Ooh. And uh, so Jim, as I recall, stayed around for a day or two for meetings and things like that. And then he went back and I was there for two weeks. I was instructed by Rick McCallum, you have two weeks to impress George. You're going to sit in this chair back behind him. <laughs> and uh, you're not going to talk to him unless he talks to you. No and, uh, good, and good luck, right? Oh, man. So as I remember, I was sitting in this chair. And this, there's sort of this, we always call it little village. You've got George, and to his left or right is the continuity person. And then there's a producer's chair. And then behind, in, in, in a pretty rarefied position, were the... ILM folks. So in that case, it was John Knoll, the visual effects supervisor and legend, uh, people looking after the match moving and you know, notes and stuff like that. And then my chair was there. And uh, well, let's say it was two, two days, three days into it. There was a lull in the shooting where they were changing the camera and the lighting was going to take 45 minutes. And then so George turns to me and says, uh, so what's your story? I said, oh, uh, I'm, um, you know, been at ILM now for this. So this would have been 97. I've uh, been at ILM for four years. And uh, you know, an animator, and I was just the anime supervisor on Men in Black. Um, previously, I worked for the National Film Board of Canada uh, and studied, you know, studied with them. Now, I knew or I was hoping that that was going to get the reaction that it did. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because in preparation for going over there, I read every interview I could get my hand on that George had given. <laughs> and I came Genius. across this great, this great book that I, it's out of like, I'm going to get it wrong, but it's like the University of Kansas or something like that. One of the state universities had a collection, a book, a collection of all his interviews from the early 70s. So this is like, you know, American graffiti uh, up through the first Star Wars or such, you know, things like that, THX 1138 and things yeah, like yeah. Talking about his early days. That's what I'm saying. And in those interviews, he said that he wanted to be an animator. And that he was a fan of the National Film Board of Canada. Oh, and so <laughs> when the op- so when the opportunity came up, I said, "Oh, I," which was true. I said, "I worked for the Film Board and I studied with uh, animators from the Film Board," which is absolutely true. Yeah. And at that point, he was like, "You, you what?" I said, "Yeah." <laughs> and see, he, he said, "Move your move your chair up here, right?" So I moved my chair up, sat beside him, and as I recall, we had you know sporadic conversations over the next many days, and we talked about movies and filmmaking and my sort of take on how we were going to approach the animation and such. Uh, and at the end of the 10 days, Rick McCallum showed up, walked me outside one of the sound stages, said, okay, you got it. You got the job. George likes you. He thinks he can work with you. You've got the right temperament. Uh, congratulations. Hey. And at that point, at that point, that's when my heart dropped. Yeah. Because <laughs> then, then it dawned on me. Oh my God! What's that proverb? Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, you got. I do suddenly the work. had something. <laughs> I suddenly had. I just literally the pressure started almost immediately yeah. because I remember being 19 years old, uh, going back to my car after seeing um, Jedi. Right. And we knew there even back then there was the rumored nine films, right? The George had made three, but he had a total of nine. Yep. Uh, and I remember thinking back then, well, I wonder how long I'm going to have to wait to see another Star Wars film. And now here I was standing on a Star Wars set in 1997, and suddenly <laughs> I've been given the animation supervisor role. Oh. And I'm like, oh, oh shit! <laughs> you just throw oh, up. Oh <laughs> god. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I didn't sleep very well. So I flew back to California, was working with the team. Oh, I'd taken over a a test or two, as I recall now. So we actually had already uh, started working um, before I went over for that, those interview days. And then I started working and the first scene that I wanted us to do, because it was kind of buried in the middle of the movie and it was with a character that I immediately connected with was the Watto junkyard scene. Um, Love it. And so we did that. We did that first, and um, um, yeah, I wonder now. I'm wondering if I did some of that. We did some of that work before I went over. Anyways, that was the first sequence we did. Awesome. And I were then I then went up to Skywalker Ranch and showed George that work, and he responded really well to it, which was fabulous. And then, <clears throat> um, then I kept going and. 
the insomnia got worse and worse and worse uh, to the point where I wasn't sure I could do the job. And oh, um, no. I remember, I remember calling up Jane Bay, who was George's assistant at the time and said, look, I need to come up and talk to George because I'm not sure I can do this job. Um, so up I drove um, Lucas Valley Road to Skywalker Ranch, went into the main house, waited in George's huge office. He came in and I explained my problem to him, which was, I have the pressure of this entire planet on me. I've got all these millions of people waiting to see this movie. And, and I don't know if I'm worthy to supervise the animation. And he's like, what, what, are, what, are, you, what are you talking about? I'm like, <laughs> well, all these people and the, and the pressure. And he goes, you don't have to worry about millions of people. And I'm like, well, that's just that everybody's been waiting to see this movie. He went, you have to worry about one person. Yeah. That's me. And I like the work. So what are you getting all worked up about? And I went, oh, he, he liked the work? He went, yeah, I think it's great. I think you and your team are doing a great job. You okay? And I went, yeah, I'm fine now. Thanks. And I drove back down. And from that night on, I slept like a baby because it was like, he's right. What the fuck? What am I thinking? Yeah. It's just him. I just need to I'd make sure he's happy. And and so, you know, I, I you know did that film. He asked me back for the second and third films. Obviously, my relationship with him got stronger and stronger. I was less worried obviously by Attack of the Clones, and I could really then stretch my wings. Uh, I knew what he liked by then and built this great relationship with him. So, um, yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's funny It's funny <laughs> to think back hey, about one's, one's mindset and how it changes. Yeah, and I've driven Lucas Valley Road to the Skywalker Ranch, and it is not an easy drive, so you got a lot of stress just on that, and then you're getting there, and it takes you oh, forever. Oh, I used to love it. I used Ooh. to love those those curves heading up the up. You know, once you're going up the hill, yeah. I used to love those. Beautiful. Yeah. I worked up there for year after I left ILM. So I was at ILM for what was that, twelve years, and then I I joined Lucasfilm Animation, which was based at Skywalker Ranch. So I drove every day for two years up there, um, uh, which I loved, and I had a, an office in one of the buildings behind the main house, which was just oh, cool. a dream. It was a total dream. Yeah. So, so that was great. In episode one, you worked on Watto. You had a direct hand in. Uh, what else did you work on? Oh, well, I was the animation. So ended like, up getting the credit of animation director. Oh. No, no, I had 60 animators working with me. Ooh. I didn't actually get to animate any shots. No, no, no. Oh, so I was the animation director. Uh, yeah, I was the I was the animation director on the prequels. Uh, so on... on um, Dude. Phantom, I think I had 60, 65 animators. I think on Attack of the Clones, we got to go drop down to 45, which is a really good number um, to have. Yeah. We get a lot done in any given week. Um, and same thing for um, Revenge of the Sith. But the, yeah, no, 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 no. We, you, when you're running a big team like that, you're uh, always constantly in, in, you know, edit and art department and story meetings and, um, uh, then dailies with my crew and and presenting work to George on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's a it's a full job yeah. uh, when you got such a big crew. So although I would have loved to have animated shots, I did animate on Men in Black, but that's the last film I've animated on. Really, because then, long time then you became the captain. Is it so? What what's <laughs> yeah. the difference? Or the coach? Between... The coach? Yeah. <laughs> so what's the difference between an animation supervisor and an animation director? They're synonymous. It's it's whether you're under a film that's um, a Directors Guild of America or not. So oh. um, you'll see on my IMDb, there's some films I get an animation supervisor credit, mm -hmm. and those are DGA films. Uh, and then there's other films where I get animation director. So the first animation director credit I got was on Phantom Menace. That's um, pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty but cool. But they mean the same. They mean the same, same thing. Okay. Okay. That's pretty neat. You help bring back Star Wars, man, and like, the, and like it's some of the coolest like cutting edge technology. Like I had Ahmed Best on recently, and we just talked about how like yes. the technology was developing as you guys were playing with it, and like it's so cool oh, yeah. to look back on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was part of the that was part of the worry. Like I remember for the longest time on Phantom Menace, we did not have the technology at ILM to create the crowds. So there was a sentence in the script that says the Gungan army walks out to battle. We couldn't do that for the six, <laughs> first six months of the movie. Oh, no. There was just, there was no way to do it. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, the technical team, the R and D team were, you know, feverishly writing tools for us. But as time ticked on, yeah, that raised my stress level. It's like, okay, how do we do this? I bet. Uh, and then obviously everything, the amazing work that Ahmed was doing uh, with our motion capture 
team and that was led by Jeff Light. Um, yeah, it was it was brand new tech. It was I'd never worked in it um, and it was a learning curve, but we were all in it together and we didn't really, I don't think, grasp at that time, you know, that we were on the leading edge of this. At the, it was just a requirement for the show. We need to get Ahmed's performance onto this character. How do, how, what's the best way to do it? And yeah. that was um, through motion capture. I bet that's another reason why, like, ILM having, you know, the masters of their crafts involved, it's like it gives someone, like, a visionary like George Lucas to be like, okay, here's what I want. I know it's not possible yet, but in three weeks it might be. Here's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Amazing. I mean, you, people don't may not know this, but George was uh, one of the first people to consider nonlinear editing. We all have it now in, like, iMovie and things like that. But he was the guy who said, okay, we should scan in film put it onto big laser discs and then give the uh, editor the ability to cut and paste in different directions uh, the way that they want, but it's all going to be in a, in a computer. And that was the beginnings of edit droid, which went later on and was, you know, made into avid and things like that, which became industry standard for um, editing. I mean, he's, you know, he was also one of the first people to go, okay, I'm going to embrace full wholeheartedly digital cameras. We're going to yeah. shoot, Star Wars, the prequels with digital cameras. We're not shooting on film anymore. Yep. Film is the past. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna, you know, plow ahead into digital, uh, you know, cameras. Dude. So he's always been like that, and that's why, he, yeah. So that you know, he needed ILM to create his first, or he he built ILM to yeah. create the visual <laughs> effects for the first Star Wars because that the, those um, techniques and and that expertise was in in. Um, Los Angeles, but it had been spread to the wind, winds, you know, because there were early films right. that had a lot of visual effects in them, but there wasn't a visual effects studio in 1975, 76 right. to be able to do what he wanted to do. So he's the one who went, okay, I got to build this thing. I got to fund this thing. I got to bring in all these amazing people and create these motion control cameras to shoot these miniatures. And, uh, and then later on, it's like, okay, and now we're going to embrace computer technology and we're going to use that on things like young Sherlock Holmes and we're going to and advance it further on into things like Terminator 2 and Abyss and, and then Jurassic. Yeah. And later on, the, the films I worked on. So, like, how cool is it working with someone who's, like, a legit visionary? Like, he's so uh, amazing. far. Like, I can't even imagine. That's yeah, amazing. No, it's... it's um The other thing about George is that he has... He's able to see... One twenty fourth of a second. Like I would show him animation <laughs> in the big theater, and we'd be I'd be showing it something. He go, wait, 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 hold on, back up, back up, back, 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 and I'm step I'm step framing back. Right, and he goes there. See the legs broken. You're like, oh my god, I didn't notice that. All right, <laughs> yep, yep, we'll fix that. And the other thing is, we'd go up for weekly art reviews on the third floor of the main house, and uh, Doug Chang and his amazing team would show all their artwork, and they had them all pinned to these massive boards, and there could be four five, six boards on any review. Yeah. George would remember, he'd say, about a month ago, you guys had a drawing of a character on the top right of a board over here. Um, <laughs> I want to see that drawing again. And um, and the and Faye, who was up there, she had like cataloged everything. So she was like, yep. I think she was taking pictures or I'm not how she, how she was able, but she would go back and she'd go, was it this one, George? And he said, yep, yep, that's the one. Okay, I want to take that character and I want to modify him a little bit. Uh, to make him a new character in this scene that I'm thinking about. You're like, wow. Shit. Like he remembered the drawings that he'd originally passed on. Man. <clears throat> so what you're saying is he's not yeah. human. He's ascended somehow. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> That's incredible. So episode one, I loved it. I was eight when it came out. So big fan. Yep. Qui-Gon Jinn's my, my thing. Ahmed is like a hero of mine. So having him on was cool. And this, oh, he's a wonderful person. Oh, he's the greatest. But we, so we yeah. talked about you quite a bit uh, when episode two rolled around because you took yep. on the Yoda fight, which again, I would have been like, let's see, I suppose nine. So 11. I remember yep. the commercials, like the trailers beforehand. And it was just like these like 10 second, you know, like three feet tall, 800 years old, this. And it would be intercut <laughs> with pieces of Yoda. And seeing Yoda with right. a lightsaber for the first time to this day has like cemented itself in my head of like, ah, a life changing moment. This. So, like, uh, right. <laughs> so, like, when, yeah. when you're yeah. tasked with showing Yoda in his prime, like, yeah, the pressure involved, 
you said you'd kind of calm down a little bit, but like, how do you even attack uh-huh. something like that? Uh, it's a great question. It's, um, uh, Booze. uh it was a whole, it was a whole process <laughs> is the quick answer. Um, I'm, uh, the, the reality was, uh, much like the line in the first script that said the Gungam army walks out to battle, uh-huh. the line in the, in the second movie was, <laughs> In a fight that defies description, Count Yodo, <laughs> Count Dooku and Yodo fight, right? You're like, what? That's cheating, George. So, and I, yeah, so I had, uh, we were in Sydney by that point. So the, the script was in complete lockdown. We would only be told, um, okay, there's a, you know, you're, you're in a sinkhole planet or there's a, you know, planet with huge trees or whatever. That's what you'd hear about. You would never get any pages when we were at, in um, San Rafael or up at Skywalker. Mm-hmm. It was not until we got to Sydney that we actually were handed the full script with our name imprinted on it. And so we all went back, feverishly read it. And yeah, so me, I was like, ah, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I then booked in time. And my recollection is I had to wait two days, oh, no. you know, because every other head, head of the department needed had questions for George. So when I finally got in, I said, OK, George, so can you extrapolate this? Because no, 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 you got to figure it out. And I'm like, <laughs> what? He's got no, 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 no. You, you, you know, he's got to. F-. I'm like, OK, but Christopher Lee is like over six feet tall. Yeah. And Yoda's this thing. He goes, no, no, you'll you'll figure it out. So I remember walking <laughs> out going, Right. Uh, and I had a couple of people that I went to, um, Nick Gillardi was the stunt coordinator. Oh, yeah. I went and talked to him, uh, and said, okay, um, assuming Yoda taught everybody how to fight with lightsaber, what's your take on how he would fight? And, and Nick was fabulous. And he was like, okay, well, these are different styles and this is what we're teaching the stunt guys. And this is Obi-Wan style. And this is Qui-Gon Jinn style. And these are the styles of the other people. And so... In his estimation, Yoda would know all of them, right? right. And I was like, okay, there's one, there's one piece of the pu- there's one piece of the puzzle, right? Mm-hmm. So then I remember walking out, and um, I, I work on the same uh, movie lot, the Fox Studios lot now. So I I still walk by these buildings, oh, cool. and I remember walking outside stage two where ILM had their um, offices, and um, I ran into Ahmed, and what? <laughs> I sort of said. So I have this thing that I have to work out. And he was like, hey, man, just come and let's let's, let's, let's talk it through. Yeah. And uh, and um, so as I remember, I got together with Ahmed a couple of times, like in his dressing room and other places and stuff. But he was fabulous because what he did for me was he introduced me to a whole bunch of anime that I wasn't familiar with. Yeah. Um, uh, and he was a martial artist himself, right? So yeah. I was able to then dig uh, dig deeper into the the kind of information that Nick had given me. Then I could take it to Ahmed, and then Ahmed then helped me through sort of the okay the physicality of it, and then with the anime, sort of the fanciful side of it and everything. Yeah. Um, and so that, those he was in, Ahmed was incredibly valuable to me as a collaborator and someone who helped me start to wrap my head around it, honestly. Um, sure. And that that continued. There were other people. I remember a, a visual effects supervisor and a great friend of mine, John Burton, and I months later uh, went to the San Francisco Film Festival. And as I recall, um, the animation director, um, Henry Selleck, had p- got, got to pick a film in the festival, and he'd picked a Jet Li film. Um, oh, sweet. Uh and in that film, which I'm now blank, Swordsman 2. Um, Beautiful. In that film, there's a night scene when uh, the, uh, the, the the ninja are like jumping from treetop to treetop. It's one of those amazing films when they can like run across the top of wheat fields and things like that, right? Yeah. So then that was another that was another element. It went, ooh, what about jumping from place to place? You know, so I, that came from the Jet Li film. Oh. And then, um, then there was, uh, around that time was... Um, What's that? The Hidden Dragon. Um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon? I can't remember the whole... That's the one. So Ben Burt, who was cutting the sequence, was using clips out of that to sort of put placeholders in for Yoda, where Yoda was going to go. He'd shrink down one of the one of the you know fighters and, and then oh, put awesome. it as a little posted stamp in the video. Yeah, so then that became part of it. And, um, and so all of it started to sort of, I don't know, coagulate in my brain and then it was like okay now i can start to see this uh and then i was also collaborating with obviously my animation team yeah and um 
and then having more talks with George. So the before they fight, George had described when Yoda comes out as sort of the gunfighter of the OK Corral, when the gunfighters, gunslingers are at the other end of the street, you know, the famous shots in the Westerns when you've yeah. got the good guy and the bad guy and there's they're standing. And there's always like a guy with a duster, you know, one of those big coats and he flips it back and then there's his six shooter on his side. Yep. And um, so George has said, look, I want I want Yoda to do that. Oh. Um, so Tim Harrington, who was actually blocking in that scene, um, uh, did that. And I remember Tim came to me and said, look, I've got an idea. He said, "It's Yoda's arms are so small that to have him reach across and pull the lightsaber off his belt looked kind of goofy. Yeah. What if I used the Force? What if I had him do it with the Force? I'm like, oh. yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yes. So Tim blocked this thing in, right? I'm getting actually goosebumps remembering yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, same, same. So then, we, so then we presented it to George and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, 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 that's great, right? Yeah, and I was like, yeah, okay, work. good. So, no, so another piece, you know, comes together. Um, and then was also the preamble in the fight where, um, you know, we'd seen Dooku wipe out these two strong young Jedi, right? And so yeah. it, it was important for me. We got Yoda coming around the corner with his little cane and everything. It's like, okay, how do we show that this guy is the true master? Right. And so the whole crushing the lightning, you know, yeah. extra burn you still have that, that shot. Yeah. That was a key shot. And that was the George Lucas. That George was like, no, no, no. This is what he's going to do. He's going to he's going to take the lightning that we just seen waste these other guys and he's going to crush it and then say much to learn you still have. Uh, and so that had got added in. And then once that it's like pieces in a puzzle. You're like, I can't figure out this bit of the puzzle and then a piece comes and you're like, "Ooh, now I can now I can see yeah, this coming yeah. together." So then putting that all together, you know, um, you know, Ahmed's amazing influence on the with introducing me to the anime, uh, the Crouching Tiger work, the um, you know, the Jet Li stuff and then input from, you know, a bunch of people all came together. But I have to say, honestly, I was still really, really nervous until the film came out because, really? yeah, because we'd never seen Yoda do this before. Sure. And, you know, Yoda was, I was, uh, what, 16 when Empire came out mm -hmm. and I loved Yoda. Yeah. Loved Yoda. Yeah. But we never seen him. We didn't even see his feet walking around, right? <laughs> True. So we had to figure out how he walked, and then we had to figure out how he's going to fight, and we had to do all this. And I thought, well, my, the, you know, the the voice in the back of my head was like, you know, I don't want to go down in history as the guy who wrecked Yoda, you know? Oh, good point. So, you know, I was part of Jar Jar, so I had that. Right, right. <laughs> and then I was on the, I was on Yoda, and uh, yeah. Nope. So it was not until I went to see a screening, a paid screening with an audience in San Francisco, and I'm sitting in, in the theater. They have no idea who I am. Ooh. I'm sitting there. Dangerous and, game, um, Rob. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then the, the sounds from the audience, you know, Yoda comes in, and then Yoda throws the rocks around, and then Yoda crushes the lightning, and everyone starts to like, the, I can just feel the energy, right? And yeah. then he starts to fight. And it's just the place went crazy. And I was like, okay, Ooh. you know, and I was slouched <laughs> down, I was slouched down in my seat and I was like, okay, I can sit up now. You know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be run out of town. So, right. Yeah. That's so I'm very proud, very proud to have been a part. There was a huge, you know, it was a huge bunch of people who collaborated on that, on that fight. And uh, so to be a, a, a player on that uh, team was um, an honor. Yeah. I feel like most things are better when there's collaboration involved. You know, just absolutely. Just I would never pretend. I mean, you know, that's actually it's a good point to touch on here. Uh, my happiest days on any film, but particularly on those Star Wars prequels, was you know, as a supervisor, you have to interpret what the director's asking for in a scene, and you take that back to the animation leads and the animators, and you you do what we call turn over the scene. You give them the scene, and you give them. And the way I think about it is like a playing field, whether it be a soccer field, football field, whatever field. It's and and. I, and I'm the coach and all the animators are on the field and I have to give them a big enough playing surface to play on. Right. And if I do that and I tell them where the boundaries are and let them play more times than not, they'll come back and surprise me with better ideas or more elaborate ideas or funnier ideas than I had thought of ever thought of. Sure. And that to me, the, the analogy I use is like Christmas morning, like opening a present. You're like, I didn't think I was going to get a, this present. This is amazing. Yeah. And then even better is taking that gift to George and then him having the same reaction going, wow, wow, yeah, this is, oh, this is great. Yeah, this is going in the movie. 
The animator is beaming because they're collaborated. They've brought something of their own. They've thought about this performance as a supervisor. You've, you've, you know, you've shepherded that to the director. Th- that's the greatest thing, you know? Um, yeah. So that was, that's part of being on the team. You could, one cannot pretend to know, have all the answers. I certainly don't have all the answers, but hopefully I, sur- I routinely sur- sur- surround myself with smart people, creative people, collaborative people who, um, who are thinking a lot about what we're doing and trying to make the best movie possible given the time we have. Sure. I love that like George has such faith in the people that he has on his team that he doesn't even like describe things, but uh, you'll figure it out. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the honor. I mean, that's the honor of it is that he's obviously you don't get onto his team unless you, you've demonstrated some potential. Right. There, right. Exactly. You, know, you have to demonstrate. So whether mine started initially with the conversations about the national film board or the films I liked or the way I was going to approach the animation or the way I talked about, working with directors, obviously those were early stepping stones. And then it was then how did I present the work and how did I collaborate with him and how did I listen to his notes? How did I execute those notes? Sure. How did I pitch ideas that he hadn't thought of? All of those things. It's a big, big, big puzzle. But yeah, at some point he would have thought, yeah, I can trust Rob. I can trust his team. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to solve this. You know, and I'm surrounded with, by geniuses like John Knoll and the yeah. R&D department and, you know, people like Hal Hickel and others, you know, as I told you, I had 60 something animators on that first Phantom Menace team. And that's just the animation team. There was all the rigging people and the modeling people and lighting people and composing people where there were probably, well, I don't remember now. There were hundreds though. There were definitely hundreds of people on those films. Yeah. You got a little mini army. We could take over. Absolutely. We could do this. <laughs> and then oh, look. <laughs> episode two, you even got a Jedi Master named after you. Pretty cool. I did. I did. Which I, did. I will tell you something I right did. now. I did not realize that until like yesterday when you're like, here's my, here's my handle. I was you're like, kidding. what? Oh my. You're kidding. Dude, dead serious. Well, <laughs> my whole life I've been like, you know who's awesome? Coleman Trebor. I, he's great. He's the dinosaur Come Jedi on. Master until this week. I was like, what? Wow. I'm dumb. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, that's all. Thanks again to John Knoll. Actually, uh, we were standing around uh, an art review or something, and and George was like looking for names. You know, he's like, "Well, I got uh, how about um, how about?" And then John, I think he was like, "Well, what about Coleman?" George was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." He said, "He said, what's your name backwards?" And I said, "Well, uh, Rob is Boar." He went, "No, no, not Boar." And I went, "Well, Robert is Tree Boar." And he went, "Yeah, yeah, okay, we'll go with that." <laughs> Coleman Tree Boar. Right. And I was like, wow. It, okay. It works. And in that same meeting, it, it, yeah, yeah. In that same meeting, there's another character called Pablo Jill, which is named after Pablo Hellman and one of the producers, Jill Brooks. Uh-huh. So that happened too. Right. So we were like, it was just this time we were living in. Right. You were like, and I remember getting at the end, you know, when all the marketing stuff, yeah, I got a box of Coleman tree boards. It's like, here oh, you go. Oh, that's awesome. And I was able to se- send one to my dad and go, here we go. After all this time, look at this. Yeah. There's a Jedi named after us. Yeah. You, you just get to <laughs> use Darth Vader's last words. You were right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you worked on my, my personal favorite movie of all time. Revenge of the Sith, man. Which one? Ooh. Really? Oh, man, dude. It was like. <laughs> Why is that your favorite? Why is that well, your favorite? Well, Star Wars was always like my jam ever since I was like three. I was like, oh, that green guy's lifting something without touching it. And it just like stuck. <laughs> but then I remember yeah. I loved the originals. Prequels came out. I was eight. Adored them. And episode three was like this perfect final piece of like, ah, it's got gorgeous pieces. And like Boga, the the thing Obi-Wan rides on Utapau, mm-hmm. my favorite Star Wars creature, mm-hmm. hands down. I just I think it's wow. I think it's beautiful. I love the designs, the colors, like but then it has the moments of levity and then the deep tragedy. I just I think it's a perfect movie. Oh, yeah. I do. Just saying. Oh wow. So oh, thank I, you. I should go back and I should go back and watch it. It's so good. I mean, <laughs> you can see things that I can't, but I think it's flawless. Absolutely love it. Oh look, I I'm very proud of the work we did did in did on that film. Obviously we were learning on the two previous films <clears throat> and I had the benefit of having a lot of people come back and work with me, you know, two and three films in a row. So we, we knew what we were doing by then. I had a great relationship with, you know, John and, uh, and George, and, and it was a great deal of collaboration. I think that shows on the screen and certainly in the, the, the quality of our work, there was less, 
worry and desperation. Can we get this thing done? And it was more about how do we put the polish into it? And how do we, you know, how do we put the best work on the screen and everything? Sure. I th- I think I would argue the opening sequence of episode three with the two ships and then they go over the edge and you see the war. I think that's the best opening of mm-hmm. any movie. I think it's ah, oh, it's <laughs> so good, man. It's so good. I loved it. I loved it. Okay. Thank you. But then Thank you. I know you went on from there and you worked on the Clone Wars movie and even directed some episodes of the series. What? Yeah. So um, that's different. So after the end of. Uh, yeah, well, I had wanted to continue working with George. And um, so at the end of uh, Revenge of the Sith, uh, I was talking to George and he said, look, we're, we're setting up or, or they had already set up. I think they'd already set up uh, an anim- Lucasfilm animation. And uh, the desire was to do animated features. So that, that was George's desire. Right. <clears throat> but everybody knew that there was going to be a ramp up, that it was going to need time to get the the talent and the, and the, the, you know, the time to develop the scripts and everything like that. Sure. Um, and George had a desire to do Clone Wars TV, TV show. And, um, and that some of that was going to be done in Singapore. Now I had gone, I'd gone over in 2005, I guess that was one of my first jobs for Lucasfilm animation was to go over to Singapore to interview and set up for that studio. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So I remember going back and forth. This is, I was with that division, Lucasfilm animation for two years, 2005 through 2007. And, Mm -hmm. um, was, yeah, it was over there with a bunch of ILM people setting up the Singapore studio or at least going back and forth. And then, um, you know, Dave Filoni had been brought on and was doing the, um, you know, supervising the, the series, had a team of writers up at Skywalker with um, uh, with him. And uh, at some point, I I put my hand up or maybe Dave came to me. I can't remember the, the order of events now, but I, w- you know, my focus was to be in the development of this feature film, which wasn't happening at that time. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to just be sitting around. So. Dave asked me, I believe, to yeah, to direct on some of the episodes. So, so I did, and I and I loved it. Actually, I had a great time. I um, I uh, I think I ended up get work working directing five episodes myself, but then I consulted on the first season on the animation as well. That's so cool. Um, yeah. So, and we were um, we had both Singapore and some of that work was done at CGCG in Taipei. Um, so I spent. Uh, at least one trip I remember vividly going over to Taipei and helping them with their lip sync animation because most of the animators there didn't speak English. So oh. I was talking through a translator. I remember that. Um, so doing that and then, um, yeah, working with the team in Singapore and then directing from Skywalker Ranch, um, which was a challenge because the time differences and everything. <clears throat> yeah. But that uh but after doing a number of those series it became clear that unfortunately george was not going to advance the feature we had built up an art team around amazing people with eric Tiemens leading that group uh amazing modelers riggers even a few animators um doing development on what would later become years and years later became a film called strange magic oh um, yeah that movie's awesome but it it wasn't um it wasn't moving along um sure by late 2007 and i had gone there specifically because i wanted to work on animated features and so i had a chat with george and he said well no you know i'm not going to be focusing on that right now and i said okay well in that case i'm going to head off and you know work on other work on an animated feature um elsewhere and that's how i ended up eventually coming down to australia to work with george miller but so that's that was my involvement with the clone wars um I think I have a consultant credit on the movie, but honestly, that was Dave's show. I was very kind of him to give me a credit, but I don't remember actually doing anything specific other than maybe giving notes on the shows that um, that movie was cut. You know, they they took scenes from shows that they'd already done mm-hmm. or we'd already done and cut them together. So, uh, okay. Yeah, that was okay. Dave's thing. And obviously Dave's gone on to great success. Um, yeah, big time. Lucas did, so yeah. did you find that like directing an episodic animated show like that seems so different from everything that you've done prior 
It was, and the challenge for me was that we didn't have anywhere close, like nowhere, like miles and miles away from the time to polish it. So, all right, uh, the TV uh, TV animators doing somewhere of fifteen seconds per week. Uh, a Peter Rabbit animator is doing three seconds of animation per week. So that gives you an idea wow. of the amount of footage. A Lego, we were doing six seconds per week. So it, it's you know the the, the speed of travel on a, on a on a television show is such that you don't get the polish. So I miss that. Sure. Uh, I, you know, I, I like working on big films that people get to see on big screens there. Um, and so, yeah, although it was, it was fun, as I said, for a while, it wasn't what I, you know, aspired to do. So it was a great thing to do for a while, but then uh, my goal was to head off into feature animation. And I've been doing that since, um, since I left um, Lucasfilm animation. That's pretty amazing. I loved Peter Rabbit. And it's kind of crazy that like one of your most recent projects is this Peter Rabbit, but one of your first projects was Dino and Flintstones. How has <laughs> yeah, you know I hadn't thought of that? Yeah. Like how has yeah. like the technology changed and the process changed from your first one to this one? Oh uh, well, I mean, inter- massively. Bonkers, like, there's right? no way we couldn't do fur. We, we couldn't do fur back in the Dino days, thing, you know, and right. fur, fur and cloth. It still amazes me what the technical people, the brilliant software writers do the, the cloth that um, was created at animal logic for Peter rabbit. His little jacket is actually, it's, it's actually, you can see every thread. Like if you zoom in, there's every thread, they really? weave the whole thing together in computer graphics. It's, it's not just a flat surface with a texture on it. It's actually, and so it behaves, it's actually a real thing. So it actually behaves like a real garment would it. They built uh, the art director actually, learned how to sew and made a life size meaning really small yeah. jacket for Peter <laughs> which was then studied by the people writing the software and they looked at where the seams and the, the stitching is and the doubling up on some fabric like any any garment you have the, the materials folded over and then double stitched and and such <clears throat> so they did that in the computer and when they did the simulations they act like a real jacket. It's just amazing to me. So that that would have been science fiction back in the Dino days. That's like, oh, well, we, we can't do that. Sure. Uh, and, and the rendering, you know, I've never been as someone who's, who is very good at rendering, but the, the lighting and rendering these days, we, we as audience members believe uh, in, in what we're seeing, you know, whether it be um, the amazing work that the, the teams at Weta do on, say, the Planet of the Apes films, um, or Paddington, you know, the Paddington films yeah. or the Raccoon and Guardian of the Galaxy. All, all these companies are doing this amazing work now where we, we audience members just believe that these furry cloth characters are real. Yeah. And they're walking around when in fact they're, they're animated. Oh, man. So what you're saying is that technology has finally caught up to George Lucas's eyes. <laughs> well, it's what it has done. I mean, over my career, and we're we're over thirty years now. Uh, it, it certainly there have been moments when directors have come to us, or producers have come from studios at the very places I've worked, and said, "Okay, you guys have now demonstrated you can you can you can achieve my vision." Yeah, you know. And George had said that. Like I remember when I first got to ILM in '93, George wasn't around. He was raising his young kids, and he was mm-hmm. you know in San San Anselmo, but he wasn't at San Rafael in the in the studio at San Rafael. Uh, and then he showed up after Dragonheart, as I recall, and he had a big group meeting with everybody in the main theater. And he said, you guys have now demonstrated uh, that you can now achieve characters that uh, were not possible in my mind with, le- you know, with um, latex and foam rubber that they could be done as computer graphics and that the audience will believe in them. And so now I'm ready to tell you guys that we're, I have written, uh, you know, the first of the prequels and we're going to start in development on that. And so I remember that being what it must've been late, late 96, early 97, because later 97, we were already, you know, I got involved and they were already set up at Leaveston. So maybe it was even earlier in 96. I don't remember exactly when it was, but I do remember distinctly because that was the first time I saw him other than Halloween parties and Christmas parties when he'd show up, but yeah, he wasn't there working day to day. That's so cool, dude. And you were there. So what, what's something that like nowadays you would give us like advice for people who want to get into like animation and the stuff you do? I, I think the first thing is you want to um, study the real world. You want to look at how people walk and talk and interact um, 
and study that because that's going to serve you really well. And if you're going to be doing, you know, animals, then you're going to study animals movement. And there's so much on the internet now you can study this stuff. And oh yeah. You can still frame through it and you can look at it and everything. Right. So you have all these resources. And then the next thing is to, um, you know, is to, is to also in the internet. Now you, you can go and hear actors talking about their, their craft and how they approach their performances. There's even, if you go to the old, you know, Older videos, there's uh, Michael Caine's got oh, amazing videos good. talking about his process. Yeah, um, I find those those fascinating, and I still point animators, young animators, to those kind of things because it's I'm trying to get the animators to get inside the head of their characters. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's all the technical stuff, but you can learn that too in terms of you know if you're animating in Maya, how do I load a model and set a keyframe? I'm just assuming that people are going to go off and do that. Um, some people are going to do it on their own time because they, you know, they can't afford to go to a school or an online class and other people are going to go, well, I'm going to dive into something like animation mentor or anim school. Those are all valuable, but a lot of it is you can just, you know, go into a site like the 11 second club or something like yeah. that and look at what people are doing and, and their performances and then try it out yourself. There's rigs you can download. There's, there's amazing, um, people like, uh, Jean-Denis Haas, who I worked with at ILM, who's got a, He's got a channel on YouTube where he, he teaches people about animation. He critiques people's animation. I would suggest start there. And then you'll get a sense of like, is this what I want to be doing? Right. Is this still exciting to me? Or is this now feeling like a drudgery or really, <laughs> really time consuming? Because I will tell people animation is a time consuming endeavor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The results can be astounding, but they can also be very, very frustrating when you're starting out. You're not getting the... <clears throat> Maybe your posing is good, you know, how you pose your character, but your timing is off. It takes a while to learn how to combine those things. So how fast does a character move or is a character moving too slowly? Or do I feel that the character has real weight? You know, weight can be a, a struggle for animators for a long time in their career. So do I believe the character is heavy enough or moving in a realistic way? Yeah. Um, so there's so many things, but uh, the internet, especially with so many people at home right now. Yeah, I know. I would be looking at <laughs> things. Um, uh, looking at these things and studying them and, and, you know, these kind of podcasts where people talk about their process and what they do, they're also very valuable. Yeah. So much information out there and, you know, most people have time now, so use it wisely. <laughs> yeah. I'm into yeah. it. And just like that, we've been talking for over an hour and a half, Rob, boom, boom, boom. We did it. <laughs> so, we did it. So before I let you go, uh, I have to ask, where can people find you online? Uh, where can they find I don't know. I never think about that. I'm on Twitter. Uh, at Arf Keldo, love it. Uh, which is A R F K E L D O. I'm on there. Um, Fantastic. You can look me up on things like IMDb uh, and see the work that I've done. Uh, and I work for a company called Animal Logic, and we have AnimalLogic.com, and you can see the work that we're doing there. So yeah, that's me. Killing it, killing it, and. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.